We can't hear you. Scott, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Once again, starting, uh, you probably just saw my mouth moving and, and heard no sounds coming out. So welcome to our monthly May meeting. Uh, we hope that you've been having a wonderful month. Uh, thank you for letting us into your living rooms this evening. Um, we have a great meeting. Uh, you can see the screen with the, uh, the, the kite there and some of the articles that are in the kite, including our uh, the plant of the month about the pineland passion flower, the speaker of the month, uh, Cly of course, Clive's bird of the month, which you'll be hearing all about, very exciting, uh, the upcoming uh, final photography group meeting of the year. Uh, the volunteer spotlight is on Helen Lawrence. Be sure to see that. She's currently in Sweden and not attending this meeting because it's six hours later there, and I know she's asleep by now. Uh, but uh, she, of course, writes our monthly plant of the month article. She's our native plant lady. And of course, a short article on the Flamingo Quest that I know many of you went on. So uh, we only have one more field trip left and our season is pretty much over for field trips. Uh, other than a June trip, which is a um, the part of the June challenge and that's uh, out to STA, STA uh, one, uh, which we do, which we do annually. And the Pelagic Quest is already sold out. It sold out to all members for only. Uh, we offered this trip to members for the first 72 hours and the members took all 40 slots of the trip. So we are really excited that our members are getting to participate in this field trip. Uh, and of course the guides are incredible. It's, the, it's Michael Brothers, who was a previous presenter for us years ago. Uh, Mitchell Harris, Larry Man Manfredi and Dan Scalaro, all wonderful experts on pelagic birds. Uh, Flamingo Quest went spectacularly. We saw flamingos at all three trips. Uh, approximately 132, 130 current members of Audubon Everglades attended. And, and we raised $844.82, which we are donating the entirety of to the Florida Flamingo Working Group. Give a round of applause to that, uh, which we're really excited about because as some of you know, it's the Florida Flamingo Working Group that is working on flamingo conservation uh, in Florida, uh, trying to have them placed on the threatened uh, bird species list so they will be further protected. And uh, we're, so we're very excited to be able to donate that money to them. And again, I'm, I so hope that some of you got to go on that trip. It was open exclusively to members. We, uh, so I'm out of 130, I know a lot of you got to go. So that's so exciting. Uh, we have some volunteer positions available, still community outreach, kite contributing writers, planter bird stewards. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the garden uh, one of our gardens, because we're having this very special um, event there. Uh, Governor DeSantis vetoes the net metering bill, 741. Thank you so much for everyone who called or emailed the governor. Uh, if you'd like to personally thank Governor DeSantis, you can call him at 850-717-9337, uh, uh, or you can email the governor as well. Um, and uh, we will be putting both all that information into the chat. So you will have that in case you'd like to do that. I know that's something that I did to thank the governor for vetoing the net metering bill. Whoops, sorry. So we have a special event at, the, um, at our uh, Pine Jog Native Plant Teaching Garden. Uh, we having our first teacher workshop there, very exciting. And it's already sold out, which is also exciting. Although not for those of you who want to attend still. <laughs> But uh, so this is a workshop for teachers. Uh, each teacher will receive a $50 gift certificate for their school garden uh, to begin planting there. Uh, then they will also receive a guided tour of the garden, which has native, 35 native species, all of which are in the uh, Palm Beach County School Board approval list. Um, they'll get expert tips on how to choose native uh, plants for birds to enhance their garden, uh, and also how to enrich their curriculum and support local Bio, biodiversity, which I know many of you are doing as well in your gardens at home. And we thank you for that. And now hopefully we can get more schools on board uh, for this. So we are so excited that this project is moving forward and we have Lauren Butcher to thank. And if you'd like to know more about the project, you can contact Lauren Butcher 
Uh, you can see her email address there on the bottom. It's lauren at audubonevergladesorg If you are a, a current teacher or, or work in a school and you'd like to participate, there is a waiting list. So uh, please, put your, please put your name on the waiting list. You can contact Lauren to be able to do that, or you can register at the information that's, that's provided there. Whoops, sorry, I'm going, my fingers are just going too fast. Okay, uh, so we have our annual membership drive. It is starting this month. You'll be receiving an email in two days, actually. Uh, Jeanette, Jeanette Mitchell, our wonderful membership coordinator, uh, will be sending out emails to remind people that it's time to renew for our June 1st, 2022 to May 31st, 2023 membership year. Uh, as you know, 100% uh, of your membership dollars go towards programming, conservation, education, and all the things that we do at Audubon Everglades. Uh, we are an all-volunteer organization, as I've said so many times, and I think you probably know that by now. Uh, whenever I get a raise in my salary, I go from zero to zero. So uh, it, is, it, is, it is a labor of love on all of our parts. Uh, so if you would like to uh, rejoin, uh, you can go and go to um, audubonneverglades.org and just hit on the membership uh, button and it'll take you to the screen where you can join. And um, if you join now, don't worry. Uh, in fact, anyone who has joined recently, uh, that, that membership is extended into the next year. So by joining now, you'll be able to be part of Audubon Everglades for all of 2022 to 2023. You'll get first dibs on some of our great field trips like Flamingo Quest, uh, we're planning another pelagic trip uh, in the fall, so you'll get first opportunity for that as well. Uh, so again, some of the new things that we're doing or things that we've done in the past and are continuing to do, uh, we're going to open up first to members and then to the general public, and uh, then that'll allow you to enjoy some of the things that you are supporting, which we think is really important. So uh, there's an upcoming photography group meeting. It is the last of the season. They are gonna take a break until September. And that's on May 16th at 7 p.m. It is a chance for you, the members, to share your photos and discuss about next season's upcoming programs. Uh, you need to register though, to be part of the photography group. And that information is there. It's simply photography. You can get the information at photography at audubonevergledes.org. And we will be putting that into the chat as well. So you have that. Uh, and that's exciting. I look forward to seeing some of your wonderful images and hearing some of the stories about them and some of your thoughts about next year. So once again, that's on May 16th. And it's going to be a really exciting, exciting photography. We have some great programs planned and some great photographers planning on presenting. Uh, so next month, we have Dr. Reed Bowman, uh, who presented about four years ago on the Florida Scrub Jay. Uh, and if you remember that presentation, it was outstanding. Uh, and Reed Bo Dr. Bowman is with the Archibald Biological Station. He is their research program director of avian ecology. Uh, the program will be on protecting the endangered red cockaded woodpecker. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen the red cockaded woodpecker. I know one of the places that it is commonly seen is Dupuy, uh, and that's up in the northwest e uh, end of Palm Beach County. Uh, they're also seen, from what I understand now, at Jonathan Dickinson State Park. They, they're having a, a program there now to uh, restore habitat for them and provide artificial nesting cavities in their habitat there. And they are adorable, as you can see by that picture. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'm hoping you'll be here next month because uh, Dr. Bowman is great. And I think you'll really enjoy his presentation. So to see all our past programming, including tonight's, uh, if you, in case you want to watch it again, uh, visit our new Audubon Everglades YouTube channel. We will get to see all the past programs, including the photography programs as well. So if there's something that you missed or that you didn't quite understand or you want to rehear, it's a great place to go and revisit programming. And you can either just click on the, on the link that we're going to put in the chat, or you can just go to YouTube and click on uh, Audubon Everglades YouTube channel, and that'll take you right to all the programs that we've offered and you can watch them whenever you want. Okay, so if you have any questions for any of our presenters tonight, please put them in the chat at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to field as many as we can. We, we usually can't get to all of them, but we do our best. And your questions, we love your questions. They're, they're thoughtful, they're thought-provoking, challenging sometimes, 
and it gives us a chance to get to hear what's on your mind, and we, we always want to be able to answer those. So without further ado, let's get to our first presenter, and I'm going to have her share her screen in a moment. So uh, our first presenter is uh, Shelley Rosenberg, who I, I think many of you may know from your travels out there at some of the local uh, natural areas and parks. Shelley Rosenberg is our uh, Audubon Everglades Purple Martin Project Coordinator. Uh, she is current, she's been in that position since 2020. She is currently uh, uh, monitoring, assisting, advising 11 different locations in Palm Beach County. Uh, she has had some of her incredible photos, like the one you see, uh, on the covers and pages of numerous uh, magazines, both uh, statewide and even nationally. Uh, she is making quite a name for herself in the area of uh, Purple Martin conservation. And we are so glad we have her as part of our team and that she's part of Audubon Everglades. And so without further ado, here she is to tell you about what's going on with Purple Martin. So uh, Shelly, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can share your screen. Are you able to see yet? All right, here we go again. I'm sorry, Scott. Scott, plan B. Plan Scott, B. plan B again. It's I okay, no problem. Okay. Sorry, everybody. So plan B is I'm gonna share Shelly's presentation and we'll play it from my screen. All right. And just give me a moment. Sorry okay. for the technical difficulty, everybody. That's okay. We we've had many we've had many over the past couple of years while we've been while we've been doing this. Oh, all right. Okay, you are on. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so welcome everybody, and thank you, Scott, for that nice introduction. I am going to give you a quick five minute overview of what's happening with the Purple Martins in Palm Beach County at our Everglades, Audubon Everglades locations. Next slide, Scott. All right, just I'm not sure if you're familiar with Purple Martins, but to give you a quick overview, they are native songbirds known for their uh, agility and and uh, they are the largest swallows in North America. They are neotropical long distance migrants, which means they breed in North America and they winter in South America. They are insectivores. They eat flying insects and drink water on the fly. They nest in colonies, although they're not always related. And they migrate as far as Northern uh, Western Canada. So they make up to 7,500 mile trips twice a year. So here you'll see just um, an overview. They're dimorphic, which means the males and females look different. They don't get their full plumage for two years. So you'll see a full adult male on the left, only swallow that is totally blue, and sub-adult male on the right getting its blue plumage. A fledgling is the same size as adults before it fledges. And interesting enough, the purple martins will stop feeding three days before, almost like a plane that has to release some of its cargo and wait before it takes off. So that's a little bit of an overview. And next slide, Scott, please. All right, to understand the purple martins, you need to understand a little bit about their history. They're secondary cavity nesters, which means they don't excavate their own nests. Uh, next bullet, please. So centuries ago, Native Americans hung out hollowed boards for nesting for them to breed and they did this for several reasons. One, to help protect the villagers and the crops from flying insects. And also purple martins will mob other birds. So when they're putting out hides to dry, crows and vultures would come by, the purple martins would mob those birds. So next bullet, please. So soon the European settlers followed that same tradition and they put up simple wooden houses for the purple martins to breed in. Next bullet, please. And then by the turn of the 20th century, Eastern Purple Martins be, relied exclusively on man-made housing. They no longer nested in cavities. So that gives you a little bit of, of history. Next slide, please, Scott. 
So what are we doing in Palm Beach County? So our focus is on purple martin conservation and to provide suitable housing for purple martins. This is a timetable. Um, they are the first migrants from South America to come, uh, they're early migrants to, to uh, Palm Beach County. We usually see the martins first. So you'll see the different stages here. They usually arrive in January, they depart in July. We're at the feeding stage. So the babies, they'll feed the babies for about four weeks and that's what's happening right now at our different locations. Next slide, please. So what we're doing, we monitor the colonies. We do nest checks at those locations that have staff or volunteers that are able to do so. And here we've got Dagger Wing, we've got Wakota Hatchie. Next slide, please. So why do we do nest checks? It gives us an overall health checkup of what's happening in the colony so we can manage it better. You'll see a little fledgling on the top, a little nestling on the top left, which uh, the parents were actually killed by starlings. So we relocated that fledgling into a nest with martins the same size. Uh, the one on the bottom left, we can tell if there's mites or problems in the nest. We do rescue fledglings and, and take out non-viable eggs. So we'll get an overall checkup. Next slide, please. And if you click on that, Scott, there you go. Meet the pinkies. So this was taken at Wakota Hatchie <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. We did our first ever nest check. We call nestlings pinkies. And just like any other baby, it's feed me, feed me, feed me. And then they go to sleep. <laughs> All right. So those are our pinkies. And then next slide, please. And there you go. So there's some uh, photographs from some of our other locations as well. Pinkies, um, they get their pin or downy feathers within a week to 10 days. So we're at this stage now where they're pretty much the eggs have hatched. Next slide, please. There you go. And they'll bring in about 60 insects per day per Martin for, for the babies. Next slide, please. All right, so their population in the last 50 years has declined significantly. They have lost one third of their population due for various reasons from weather to loss of lack of housing. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to help Audubon Everglades? Okay, so we do um, education and community outreach throughout Palm Beach County. We also support new landlords that are interested in starting colonies and existing landlords. Next slide, please. And we partner with, we foster partnerships with public locations throughout Palm Beach County to help them and to uh, have a more unified effort. Next slide, please. So who, and together we're making a difference. And who are these locations? We've got Daggerwing Nature Center. Epiphany Lutheran Church in Lake Worth. Green Cay Nature Center. We are uh, in the process of getting all new housing for Green Cay next season. Lion Country Safari is a great program that with the Purple Martins to help the insect population control eye infections for the rhinoceros and zebra. And we're working on a data paper right now for that. Okahili Nature Center, we're still trying to track some martins there. We just relocated the houses. Palm Beach County Fire Rescue Station 25 is a great population of martins. And Palm Beach County Rescue Station 27, they're both in Wellington. Peaceful Water Sanctuary, we're working on new additional housing as well there. They're at full occupancy. Riverbend Park, we just relocated the houses from the visitor center to another area. It's much more viable on a lake for Cowpen Lake. So that has already happened. Wakoda added Chi Wetlands, we added a new house this year. We're going to add another set of housing next year. Wellington Environmental Preserve, they love the horses. And if you have any questions, you can email me at Shelly at Audubon Everglades.org or the email that Scott posted earlier. And please tell your friends about it. It's a tough life for Purple Martins. We need all the help they can get. Thank you, everybody.
Uh, Shelly, just a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Um, so um, the um, and so one Jeannie Mauser says no action in my Purple Martin condo yet. Any reasons why? Uh, Jeannie, you need to be uh, have it located in an open area and also near water. And I think I've spoken with Jeannie before. Okay. And another opportunity to attract Martins is to play the Dawn song. It's a recording. So they are colonial nesters. They want to be around other purple martins. So if you play the dawn song in the morning hours, that might attract martins. Sometimes it takes several years before martins will find your colony. Is there a specific height that the nest box needs, needs to be asked, asked Kathy Ombach? Uh, you know, not necessarily. You want it away from the ground, of course, other from predators. But at Lion Country Safari, we've got way up high above the rhinoceros. It doesn't seem to bother purple martins. Okay. But they need uh, to be away trees where predators. How much does a how much does it cost approximately to erect a purple martin house? Well, there's different types of housing. There's houses and boards, so they can range from a couple hundred dollars to thousands, depending on how um, elaborate you want to be. But okay. there's predator guards and baffles and other accessories. Will a single gourd attract a purple martin? Yeah, absolutely. You never know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, uh, Susan Young says, thank you, Shelley. Ria says, we have purple martins at our, at our houses here at Bellagio. Oh, and uh, Jeannie Mauser says, I will find the Dawn song and give it a try. <laughs> so she's all in. <laughs> Okay, well, Shelly, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Thank, thank you. you so much for what you do. It is outstanding. And when I was at Peaceful Waters yesterday, the Purple Martins were calling your name. Oh, I'm sure <laughs> they were. <laughs> thank you thank all. You. Thanks, Shelly. Okay, so let me uh, just share my screen once again real quickly. Uh, get this presentation now. Okay. Sorry, I am just playing catch up here. Okay, there we go. All right, so we have our uh, bird of the month now uh, with uh, wildlife biologist Clive Pinnock and his extraordinary partner, Cece Pinnock, who I think handles the tech, but I think also in, uh, assists in many other ways. Clive, Cece, take it away. It's all yours. All right, thanks so much, guys. Um, I'll get this up here. I'm not sure to stop sharing my screen. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, here's, uh, here's our bird of the month. And this is the California condor. Uh, this particular bird looks like something out of a Stephen King movie, um, just because of the way the bird is cr crouching and the feathers extended. They actually quite often adopt that posture when they're cold. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what their habitat is like and why they're exposed to the cold and why they, uh, how they deal with it. But uh, this bird is actually quite interesting. Um, it's uh, a member of the, the vulture family and uh, there's a biological function that uh, uh, helps the bird because of that naked head and neck. Quite often uh, when they're feeding, they actually do poke around inside the carcass. And so that enables the bird to keep the head and the neck area free of parasites and uh, potentially harmful uh, situations to the bird. But what you're looking at there is an adult. And our next um, slide gives you an idea of the comparison between the adults and the juvenile bird. You'll notice the adults are black overall with the white patch under the wing. Um, very, very uh, profound uh, in, in trying to, in seeing the bird. I was quite fortunate in my work at uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area. Myself and the local wildlife biologist, uh, Bob Lemons, we 
would go to the Vermilion Cliff area where these birds were being uh, propagated and uh, would help with uh, monitoring the birds, making sure that they were doing well. It was uh, one of the highlights of my Park Service career to be on the uh, ground floor, so to speak, uh, with a project like this, um, uh, breeding the condors in captivity um, and getting the, them back out. Uh, on the right, you'll see what a juvenile bird looks like. It's not as dark as the adult, and uh, they do have more of a, a mix of black and gray. Uh, notice also the head color is much, much darker than that of the adult birds. The um, uh, photographs here show uh, um, IDs and telemetry that's placed on the birds. And basically all the birds that are free flying today uh, have these marks on them, these identifying uh, symbols on them so that they can be recognized um, by the researchers at a great distance. Uh, the uh, range of the, the birds, uh, California condors once actually ranged from British Columbia, Canada, all the way down to Baja, California, Mexico. The range shrank, however, with the increase of European settlers moving west. And uh, the causes of the decrease, because the populations did decrease quite a bit, the causes included poisoning, shooting, habitat degradation, and actually the collection of eggs and feathers. You can see uh, from our range map now just how small the uh, range is that contains these birds, considering how expansive the ranges were at one point. The habitat that these birds occur in are basically uh, Pacific beaches, uh, mountain meadows, uh, mountain forests, and cliffs. And um, cliffs in particular, uh, are incredibly important to the birds. These birds weigh on average about 20 to uh, 24 pounds. Uh, their wingspan is a full nine feet and uh, in length, they're about four, uh, four feet in length. So quite a, a heavy bird that 20 to 24 pounds. And so needing to uh, become uh, airloft, they uh, require uh, being in places where there's a lot of thermals, uh, updrafts, um, uh, wind currents uh, hitting the sides of cliffs so they can literally step right off into those up uh, updrafts and are able to become airborne at that point. So uh, they spend quite a bit of time uh, soaring on these massive wings, very broad wing feathers and uh, tails that uh, help them stay aloft and they need to flap very, very infrequently. Um, they will literally spend hours, many, many hours soaring uh, on these thermals looking for food. Their primary diet uh, uh, involves or includes uh, the carcasses of cattle, sheep, um, uh, uh, rabbits, um, uh, sea lions, many, many different kinds of uh, uh, dead animals, and because they frequent the uh, the California coast, they will even take advantage of the carcasses of whales that die and get washed up um, on the beaches as well. As I mentioned before, you can see that naked head uh, and neck area much closer, and uh, depending on the size of the carcass that they're feeding on, they will venture quite often to stick their heads all the way inside so they can get to those juicy entrails. And uh, <laughs> it's so doing, it actually um, protects the head and um, uh, neck area. You can imagine if they had feathers on their heads and necks, what a mess that would be. Now, um, in, in feeding the, in the way they do, they do spend quite a bit of time uh, bathing, uh, not only sunbathing, which dries up any dead excess skin, around the neck that eventually falls off, but they will also um, uh, get around a water source and they spend quite a bit of time in the heat of the day, actually bathing, cooling themselves off. In regards to heat, when the birds uh, get excessively hot, they will, like many vultures, defecate on their legs and the mixture of urine and feces uh, actually cools the blood that passes through the feet, 
which eventually works its way up through the rest of the body. And that ends up cooling the bird completely. Uh, quite an interesting uh, mode of air conditioning uh, or cooling. Um, anyway, so that's how these guys uh, do that. Both male, adult male and female are identical. And uh, they generally don't reach sexual maturity until they're about six to eight years of age. Um, once they uh, do reach sexual maturity, these very or uh, otherwise gregarious birds um, will actually break off into monogamous pairs. And only during the breeding season is when these birds will separate themselves from the rest of the group. Uh, 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 pairs will actually uh, fly around looking for a nesting location, which uh, again, generally is on the edge of cliffs or um, uh, very rarely in trees um, like giant sequoias and redwoods, but more times than not on cliff ledges and uh, little caves that they can find. They don't really uh, make a nest per se. Uh, they generally will use whatever is available uh, to them. The average nest size is about three feet and some of the well-used ones can be as deep as eight inches. Uh, but for the most part, they usually uh, just scrape out an area. Um, the uh, once copulation is uh, established, the female lays one egg. The lower left uh, is an example of the egg and the, the color, the typical color. Uh, both parents share incubation duties and the total uh, incubation period is in general about 56 days. Uh, once the eggs hatch, both parents um, uh, care for, for the young, and they actually will regurgitate uh, food uh, to feed the young. You can see that middle photograph on the right uh, and the lower right, what the young actually looks like. When they're first hatched, they actually are covered with an off-white down, and then as they grow older, that color, the down color, uh, gets darker. Um, as I mentioned, uh, incubation is 56 days. They share uh, that incubation um, together. And uh, the young takes about five to six months before they're capable of flight. Once they are capable of flight, they still, believe it or not, use another, an additional six months before they break free from the parents altogether. So it takes these guys on average about a year to complete a, com uh, a nesting uh, cycle. And so with that, these birds don't nest every year. They will actually nest every other year because of uh, the length of time that it takes for uh, the adult birds to eventually uh, get rid of the care of the young. Um, in closing, uh, I just want to mention that um, uh, as, a, the, uh, as of the end of 2019, there were a total of 518 condors in the world with 337 of those flying free in the wild. However, condors today are still dying due to threats of lead poisoning, consuming litter, uh, micro trash, electrocution from power poles, and even strychnine that's used sometimes to uh, kill coyotes. And uh, so, even though the numbers have increased significantly since the uh, uh, 1980s, when uh, efforts were made to um, uh, reproduce uh, the entire remaining population in the wild, uh, they are bouncing back nicely, but they are still having issues with uh, lead poisoning. And that's it for our condors bird of the month. Any questions? Wow, Claude, that was spectacular. Uh, what a great bird. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. We do have some questions, so let me go over them. Um, so uh, Alice Turner asks, do they find their carrion by scent or by sight? It's actually by sight. What they do is they look for uh, the gathering of other uh, aerial predators like vultures. And so as they're soaring around, they actually lock in or key in on other uh, vultures. And uh, once they spot that, then they go in. And uh, of course, because of their size, they literally take charge of the kill 
at that point because the smaller black and turkey vultures will not try to stand up against them. However, their big challenge is the golden eagle because the golden eagle is also very opportunistic looking for carrion. And once they spot that, the, uh, um, the uh, condors give way to the golden eagle. Uh, and I suspect it's because of those talons. They are no match <laughs> for the talons of a golden eagle. I guess there's always a bigger bully out there. Huh? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, have, uh, uh, Sher uh, uh, Cherry Patillo asks, have you read that recent research of black vultures indicates the featherless head may assist in thermoreg thermoregulation? Um, I have not, but I, it, it, I would not be surprised if, uh, if that were the case. The primary thing with uh, vultures and the condors has always been um, bathing, spending a lot of time, in locations, especially for the condor, uh, they actually do take communal baths, if you will, where several of them will flock together at a watering area and bathe to cool down. And as I mentioned before, defecating on their feet, um, <laughs> vultures in general do that to help cool the blood circulating through the rest of the body. But I, I, it would not surprise me if that naked head and neck also assist in thermal regulation. Okay, well, no comment on the defecating on the- Yes. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so uh, uh, Judith, uh, Gara, J Judith Gerard uh, mentioned that, um, and she gives the, uh, the link as well in the chat, that NPR uh, posted an article today about a release of some condors in Northern California redwood forest, right. which also answers Elisa Rudolph's question, is a condor release planned for this year? So they just had one. That's great. Yes. Yeah, and as I said uh, earlier, I was quite privileged to be a part of the, the whole Condor program um, uh, and I've also been there to see some of the releases in the Vermilion Cliffs uh, region of, of uh, Arizona. Okay, wow. It's very exciting. Cl Clive, you, you've had such an, a great a great life with, as, as a wildlife <laughs> biologist. I'm, I'm envious. Uh, uh, Cherry Patillo asks again, did I see an exposed crop in your second image? I don't think she's talking about you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, there it was. There is an exposed crop. And it's interesting. Um, quite often when these vultures are searching for a source of food, uh, they can go up to two weeks at times before they actually locate a carcass. Uh, they tend to prefer fresher carcasses than much older ones. But once they do locate a carcass, they gorge themselves and they can hold up to three pounds of excess meat in that crop area, which is an extension of the esophagus. So they gorge themselves and then still store excess food in that crop up to three pounds. And, and I assume that's also how they feed their chicks, they regurgitate. That's exactly right, yes. Okay, right. okay. and yeah. finally, we have a romance question. Clive, do they mate for life? They do, they are monogamous. Uh, um, I believe I had mentioned that, but if I did, uh, my apologies, they are monogamous. And so once they establish their pair bond, uh, they are, the pairs are together for life. Even those non-breeding parts of their year uh, when the flocks, groups of them are together, the pair still stays together throughout the entire year. Wow, well, that was wonderful, Clive. Thank you so much for another great presentation and another great education on, a, on another one of our wonderful birds. Uh, Clive, You're very welcome. I, I can't wait till next month. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Glad you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Clive. You're welcome. Okay, so we have our final speaker of, of this evening, our feature speaker, and I'm going to let uh, Autumn Coyote introduce him. But before I, I, I give way to her, I just want you to know, I, I mentioned this in, the, in our brief um, uh, uh, waiting room, our, our brief uh, chat beat prior to the meeting, that Captain J. Marvin is coming to you from his squad car. Uh, it is our first presentation ever from a squad car, perhaps the first presentation you know, at any Audubon from a squad car. I don't know, but I'm real excited as, as to have this happening uh, for us tonight. And it also shows you Captain Marvin's dedication as well. So without further ado, Autumn, uh, I'll let you introduce uh, Captain J. Marvin. 
Hey, everybody. So yeah, maybe uh, it will be our only ever presentation from a squad car. Um, unless one of these times I go out to my car and sit out there and do this uh, just to steal the thunder. Um, so Captain J. Marvin, he's been in law enforcement with the state of Florida since 95. Um, he's got a Bachelor of Science in Geography and Cartography from FSU. Um, this is my first ever cartographer that I've ever met. Um, he's also, he's the president of the Florida Marine Intelligence Unit. He loves protecting wildlife. Um, he's a camper. Um, he's got avian nests in, or uh, boxes in his backyard. So we love that. Um, so he's gonna talk to us a little bit about um, the illegal trapping of songbirds and what we all can do to help. So uh, Captain J. Marvin, take it away from your vehicle. Thank you, Autumn. Um, bear with me with this uh, system here, I'm not that provision. So I'm gonna try to share the screen right now. Is it showing? Not yet, not yet. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a minute. How about now? Nope, we still see you. <clears throat> nah, I did exactly the same as last time, but it's not, uh, not showing. When you, when, you, when you hit share screen, hit share screen all the screens. There, oh, there you go, there you go. Something's happening. Okay. But we're not seeing anything. You, you've put up the dark, like a dark screen. There you go. Excellent. Yeah? Yep. All right, now all you have Maybe to do is- the, uh, the habit of uh, remote uh, broadcasting. <laughs> are we good we are great okay well uh thank you for the invitation and uh i'll give you a little more background about uh myself um and in my job um, I'm the regional investigations captain uh, for South Florida, uh, the extreme South Florida. So my region is uh, Miami-Dade County, Collier County, and then Monroe County down in the Keys. And then I oversee all the investigations in the three counties. Um, so uh, like Autumn said, you know, uh, it's my 28th year doing this. And uh, initially I worked for the predecessor agency uh, that joined that was called the Florida Marine Patrol and they joined the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission in 1999 and created the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and that's where we're at now. Uh, so the previous part, the early part of my career, it was uh, with marine uh, enforcement with fisheries and, and, and some of the occasionally, uh, you know, some of the seabirds and, and such. So uh, as we I got into investigations uh, many years ago. We uh, we started uh, were introduced to uh, violations with illegal uh, migratory bird trapping, which was all new to me. And uh, and we I learned a lot uh, from some mentors. And then now I'm the mentor at the end of my career, teaching others to uh, to do this type of enforcement. So it was, uh, you know, we had a huge push um, a few years ago, which was the um, the hundred year anniversary of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and uh, really, it's one of the oldest uh, United States or any law in the U.S. to uh, protect uh, wildlife. And uh, so now we're, you know, over a hundred years. Um, and, and initially, you know, it was a convention that included um, Great Britain and the United States and, and Canada, everybody working together because of the, the fact that the birds are migratory and they, uh, and they don't uh, abide by uh, state or uh, national lines. So the, uh, we have a statute um, under US um, law that makes it unlawful without a waiver to pursue hunt, take capture, kill, or sell birds uh, of those listed species. And there's um, 
around 800 listed species. And many of you know more, much, much more about birds than I do. And, and I understand that, but I'm gonna do the best I can. And so bear with me on maybe my lack of knowledge. And, and if you know more, you can comment and that'll, that'll help me learn as well. So the, the, the treaty you know, prohibits the, the killing and possession, and then there's additional penalties for sale and, and uh, of, the, of the species, which makes it a, uh, a felony, a federal felony offense. Statute does not discriminate um, you know, if you have a dead or alive bird or parts thereof. So it could be feathers, eggs, nests, complete uh, protection under the, uh, under the law. So here's the uh, unfortunate uh, example of someone that were uh, trapping and caging migratory birds. And unfortunately they didn't take care of them or they, uh, some of the species died within the cage. So each of those um, dead birds or carcasses are, uh, are still a violation under the law. And the Florida statute, um, we adopt the federal law that makes it also uh, a violation with a state law. Here's an example of what our officers and investigators see in the field uh, when we're out on uh, winter mornings early looking for people out there doing the, these types of violations. And as you can see, they're very difficult to spot. And uh, mostly the folks don't stick around and, and tend the traps. They tend to deploy the traps and leave and then come back an hour or two later and check on the traps, remove any birds they've caught and uh, move on to other traps. Occasionally they do uh, stay in the area and, and that's a, an indicator for us that hey, there might be something more going on. You know, here's a, a, some of the uh, migration patterns. Obviously we're in the uh, Atlantic coast uh, route. Um, a lot of migration uh, where I live, um, Two years ago, it's just an incredible migration. I woke up in the middle of the night with uh, birds chirping and my wife said, what's going on and what time is it? And it's uh, three o'clock in the morning. It's just incredible migration right to my backyard. So the, the two main targeted species in the industry are indigo and painted bunting. Uh, some other birds that are caught, uh, some to sell and some are just, um, as a result of the of the traps, you know, we have the cardinals, orioles, sparrows, all different types of sparrows. Blue and rose breasted grosbeaks, they are also um, prized. And, and some of those, especially the rose breasted uh, males, and they, they can go for two or $300 a piece on this uh, black market. Mockingbirds and blue jays occasionally, mostly uh, they're not the intended um, type of bird to capture. So why do these people do this? And uh, just like you all are bird enthusiasts uh, in a different way, uh, some of the traditions in, in some of the um, Caribbean islands, Cuba, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, uh, and other parts of South America, it, it uh, not only is it a way to make money, but it, it's uh, kind of a traditional thing that they uh, they do, just like you may be into uh, fishing or hunting, and this is something that traditionally that they do. Uh, many of them don't see it as a, a problem. It's just uh, catching another type of animal. The business is expansive, and uh, some of our suspects, um, you know, they sell hundreds of birds uh, a season, um, and birds can range from fifty dollars up to into the thousands of dollars, depending on the plumage and the color coloration uh, of the bird being sought. And uh, interestingly, uh, part of the hobby is they'll have singing competitions with these songbirds and they'll hang out and uh, display their birds. And then they'll judge which birds sing the best and they'll, they'll wager money and gamble on it too. So a lot of different uh, facets of the illegal industry. So, you know, we, we do have uh, such a short winter here and, and many of the migratory birds, you all know more than me, but uh, many of them continue on to the Caribbean uh, and then some uh, maintain a residence year round in South Florida 
and others are, are just, this is the final further south destination before they go back home to the north. And because of, you know, so many different factors of loss of habitat, uh, climate change, um, man-made uh, devices that, that kill them, or um, lack of uh, places to nest, uh, specifically the painted bunting is, is now going to be classified as a species of, of special concern. And the, and the male painted is one of the prized um, targets. Here's an example of some of the types of traps. Very in, from they vary. You know, some uh, are very intricate like this, where they're made out of wood with tiny little pieces uh, that they put together like a puzzle. Uh, there's also um, metal, uh, steel, and aluminum traps that are used, but it, it's a, a deadfall type trap. So they, it requires uh, they put some bird seed in there to attract, and then they put a uh, what we call a bait bird in there. And uh, typically, the bait bird is the female of the species of the target species that they're targeting. Uh, bunting is going to be a, a female painted or indigo bunting. And the bird will land when it hears the singing and sees some seeds. It lands and it's a deadfall trap, and it opens and closes, and they're inside the trap. And the other one comes, and they're one after the other. And I've seen, I've personally seen. Uh, these traps catch two or three birds within five minutes. They do get beaten up a lot. Uh, you can see the broken, uh, the injuries to the, the head and beak because uh, they don't want to be caged. And uh, even if they're trapped and transferred to a, a cage at home, um, they, beat, they beat themselves really badly against the uh, the side of the, the cage or, or trap and they get injured. Uh, sometimes if they keep them for a uh, prolonged period of time, they become, they get wing atrophy and they're unable to fly. So when we rescue the birds, sometimes we'll try to release them and they just hop around and they're unable to, uh, to fly. And then we have to rehab them and uh, until into a larger aviary where they can actually fly and then be safely released. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, here are the, the main targeted species of painted, which you all, I'm not going to uh, bore you. you, you all know more about these birds than I do, uh, insect feeders, um, the tiny beautiful birds, and here's the, the top, the painted male, um, male indigo in the middle, and then the uh, rose breasted rose beaks, a larger bird and a higher flying bird and a uh, beautiful bird as well. The common northern cardinal, they end up getting trapped frequently. Uh, yellow faced grasswood. Uh, Captain uh, Marvin, I'm sorry, yes. this is Scott Zucker. Uh, your, the, your speech has, uh, your quality of your speech has deteriorated somewhat, and I don't know uh, why. It's, it's kind of a little garbled. Uh, we, can still, we can still basically understand what you're saying. I was just wondering if there's anything you can do on your end to make it clearer. Let me check this. Um, That's better. I've got full bars on. Okay. That's great. Okay, Thank sorry you, about Martin. that. Uh, do I need to repeat, Scott, and go back? No, no, you, we could understand you. This is just better. Okay, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll uh, try to come closer to the microphone. Okay, uh, and then we got the, the blue male blue gross beak uh, on the bottom. On the left, you know, another, uh, which I wasn't very familiar with the bronze cowbird on the left. Uh, so when a few years ago, when the first one, we, uh, we had a guy trap one and, uh, and my investigator uh, called me and sent me a picture, texted me and said, I've got, got this bird. I'm not sure what it is, but it's very unusual because it has a red eye. So, you know, I searched up a uh, you know black bird with a red eye and i'm like oh bronze cow bird okay haven't seen those before and they are a, a migratory bird treaty acted uh protected bird uh let's see we got a uh white crowned uh sparrow and then a um, indigo uh bunting on the bottom right some more indigos and uh female painted on the bottom 
And it, it, as you know, you know, well, maybe you don't, but it, uh, just like in the wild, it's difficult because they move so quickly. And so for us, for evidence documentation, it's also extremely difficult to take a picture of a bunting uh, flying around in, in a cage or a trap. So uh, we, we've learned to handle the birds and, uh, and so we can take uh, good photographs for, uh, for court purposes. So on the, this one's uh, one of the metal traps that I mentioned um, before. Um, you know, it depends on what, you know, what the target is and, and the environment and what they'll do. But many times the suspects will, you know, hang the birds. Uh, sometimes they'll lay them on the, set them on the ground. Other times they'll, they like uh, like a bush or something, maybe three to six feet high and they'll hang the uh, traps in the bushes. They like any kind of a cane grass um, because the birds enjoy uh, roosting in, in the cane grass. Uh, and then other times, you know, they'll give themselves, the suspects will give themselves away because they're, they're parked there and it's a, a vehicle parked in a remote, a remote area. They may be pretending that they're fishing. Uh, and then we uh, look around and, and one of the telltale signs that they're involved in bird trapping is bird seed because on the trap they use the bird seed and bird seed gets everywhere, especially in a moving vehicle. So. We'll take a look around in the bed of the pickup truck or in the in the vehicle, and we see birds. See, we know that there's more than fishing going on. In the urban setting, uh, our our folks are trained to drive around and look for signs. But a lot of the times, we get tips from uh, bird lovers like you all or concerned citizens that call us and they say, "Hey, my neighbor has got some birds, and I know they're illegal. I see a red cardinal." And I know they're protected. Can you guys send somebody out to take a look? So a lot of times the tips from uh, from the public really help us uh, make these cases. So we can come and take a look with binoculars and identify the birds and uh, knock on the door and possibly get a search warrant if they don't want, uh, want our presence there and uh, make a case like that. Uh, here's a case in Collier County uh, in a Pineland area and uh, these these traps are specifically targeting, targeting the uh, rose-crested grosbeaks because they tend to like uh, to fly higher and they'll uh, use a piece of line and lift the traps higher up in the canopy. You can see how high that is and uh, the arrows indicate the, you know, uh, where the, uh, the tether is to, they'll tie that off so that they can hoist the, the trap way, way high up in the tree. So yeah, typically the bunting species are trapped from uh, ground up to 25 to 30 feet. Um, and then uh, additionally, like uh, another form of a trap is called a mist net, which we'll talk about in a minute, which is, a, is defined as a trap uh, under our statute, our, our new rule that uh, was implemented a couple of years ago. Um, but it's a, a very fine net that uh, it's almost invisible to humans or birds and they fly into it and they get uh, entangled and then they're caught. This is an example of the mist net. It, it doesn't look very invisible at that angle, but um, trust me, they're almost impossible to see. It's such a fine monofilament uh, netting. Here's an example at a, at a farm. Uh, this one is in Dade County, uh, where they just hang the trap on the outskirts of the perimeter of the farm on a post or a fence, fence uh, line, something like that. And the trappers, you know, they uh, they've learned uh, that the the birds, you know, what type of uh, uh, environment the birds like. Um, they will use flyways um, such as canals. Uh, railroad tracks, uh, power line easements, especially ones that run north and south. Uh, they know that the birds will use those uh, flyways to navigate on their trip south or north. Smuggling. So many of the birds that are caught in the Caribbean uh, have value here in the United States and they are smuggled on airplanes right into our airports and Miami International, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, 
all those airports have had uh, a lot of uh, smuggling of, of uh, all different types of fish and wildlife, but specifically the uh, painted buntings and, and other protected migratory songbirds. They've used it's ingenious. Some of these things are like the old style uh, hair curlers that ladies used to use back in the day, probably not as popular now. Um, little canisters that they drill holes in. Uh, you may ask yourself, you know, how do they do that? Uh, that will hide them in fanny packs on their for on their bodies. And for example, from Cuba to Miami is. You know, it, it's probably like a 15 to 20 minute flight. Uh, so even at the delays at the airport, uh, departure and arrival, you're looking at maybe an hour or two that they have to keep the birds on their person to smuggle the birds. And, and we've learned that they've even used sedatives on the birds. They'll give them some water with a sedative and the bird won't, won't uh, chirp or make any noise and alert authorities. Here's one that uh, we have a, a we have canine that uh, we use to target uh, all different types of fish and wildlife. And uh, in this case, um, the Cuban bullfinch, which unfortunately is not a protected uh, MBTA protected species, was uh, in this little spice container and, and taped to the leg of this uh, smuggler. More examples of the birds, it's, very, it's, a, it's a shame because uh, many of the birds don't survive the trip. So a few years ago, um, we had a meeting in Miami with some of our Florida Fish and Wildlife Commissioners and, uh, and we were given a presentation at the Miami airport. We went to the airport, we saw some of the shipments of uh, fish and wildlife in the cargo areas. And we talked about this uh, issue of the illegal songbird trapping. And one of our commissioners, Commissioner Soule, uh, who just departed the commission, uh, who was the previous secretary of the Florida Department of, of Environmental Protection, he says, he asked the question, he said, why are the traps uh, legal? And, uh, and we said, well, you know, they, they, there's legal uses for the traps. So he said, well, let's change that. And he did. Um, it was about a year and a half effort. Uh, I had no idea how much work uh, could be involved in a rule change. Uh, there's a, a lot of processes involved, processes involved. You have to go through a, uh, you know, the commission and, and hearings and, and people that object to it. Um, but we we're successful. And, and now it is illegal to possess uh, these bird traps in Florida. Now, some of the reasons um, are for the enforcement part that I mentioned earlier. If we do, if we previously to this uh, new rule, if we were to find somebody uh, out there trapping in the field and they had one of these traps, and uh, let's say that they saw law enforcement come and they opened the, uh, the door and the bait bird flew out, that would leave us empty handed, literally. So we would have no violation because the trap itself is not a violation. If we didn't, weren't able to uh, document and confirm the uh, species of the, the bait bird, we would have no violation. So that was another, uh, another uh, tool for us to use for these people. So having the trap itself deployed is a violation now. So I can't believe it's been this long with COVID. Uh, time goes by quickly. So October 3rd, 2019 uh, is when the, the new uh, rule took place. So it, it, it uh, makes it prohibited to place, use, place, or possess, um, or allow the placement of bird traps without a permit. And there's a few exceptions to the rule. So like I mentioned earlier, some of these hoop uh, nets and the mist, uh, the mist net, which is on the right there, uh, those are all uh, meet the definition of a of a trap in Florida. So, some of the folks that were um, uh, opponents of the of the rule um, 
rule change. They they were they used it for different things like um, pest control, uh, some of the captive wildlife folks to recapture uh, birds, um, and I think I've got a few slides on that. There is a uh, exception for uh, federal authorization uh, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service for ESE species. And Endangered Species Act species. Uh, and this is what I talked about, like so game, uh, game farms and such that um, have quail. Um, there are exceptions that they can get a permit for, for uh, captive reared game on private hunting reserves or pen uh, uh, pen rail raised quail and raised quail falconry some of the falconers they uh, they use it for uh, capturing non-native birds to train their raptors so that was uh, another one but uh, we do have an exception so if, if there's a need a, a need to to do this uh, to have a trap that they can have a a permit, they can obtain a, a permit and they can they can continue to trap. Airport safety was another one. There's a need on uh, critical uh, infrastructure for airport safety that uh, allows for trapping of birds to relocate the birds. And I mentioned the captive wildlife facilities. You have an escape and the birds, uh, they need to be re, re, uh, recaptured. Nuisance birds uh, with a pest control, um, they can have a pest control license and they, um, they're able to obtain the, uh, the permit for the trapping. They have to be registered and uh, labeled. So if we were to, or the public were to run into a trap out there um, and we get a complaint and we, we find the trap unattended, we could see that it's labeled and see the permit and, and know that it's, it's not a violation and uh, move on to the next uh, customer. And this is the last slide. Uh, this is a, a release, a massive release we did a few years ago at uh, Everglades National Park with some of our partners, um, US Postal Inspector uh, Police, uh, Customs and Border Protection, Florida Fish and Wildlife, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and then the gentleman with the uh, white shirt on, he's a United Assistant United States Attorney that did some of the prosecutions during this investigation. And I'll open it up to any questions. That was, that was great. That was really interesting. I feel like, um, I would. I. I want to see the Law and Order version of this now. I feel like NBC has a new show. <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's funny that you mentioned the uh, you know the legal uses for these traps because you know we banned birds and when we banned birds we used the, the mist nets. Um, and somebody mentioned that um, somebody in the chat mentioned that the painted bunting bunting mobile banding team. They were banding bunt buntings and they were approached by um, a Florida Fish and Wildlife officer, but they had all their documentation, so they were cool. Um, somebody, uh, somebody asked, "Are you? Do you ever ban the birds before you release them?" Um, we, I think, uh, with some of our partners with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, we have. Um, interestingly, uh, some of the people involved in the illegal um, trapping and sales. Actually, we're doing the banding themselves to help identify which uh, birds were uh, in their uh, aviary. Huh. So we've seen that as well, but no, huh. not our law enforcement. We don't we don't ban them. Um, so that, and I have this is a question that I had when you were showing the Cuban bullfinch. So you were saying that's not a, a protected that that bird was not protected. So what happens to that bird, the, the thigh bird, the guy who had the bird on his thigh? Uh, well, pretty much uh, all the birds, any kind of fish and wildlife that's smuggled in um, illegally, unfortunately, uh, is probably euthanized because it can carry um, some, you know, diseases and such, and it would have to go into quarantine, and most of them won't mm -hmm. even survive in quarantine. So, mm -hmm. 
Um, so when and when you catch these guys with thigh birds or whatever, what 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 kind of penalties are there for this? So like uh, I kind of didn't fully answer the one question. So you're at the airport and you know we get oh, somebody yeah. that's smuggling birds on their person. Mm -hmm. That that's a that's just a general smuggling. So if you when when we you know if you travel abroad and you return to the United States, you know you have to fill out the little customs declaration. What are you carrying? If you don't fill that out, that's a failure to declare uh, that you're bringing something into the United States. So that would be a penalty in itself uh, for uh, not declaring uh, fish and wildlife. But, and then and then on top of that, there's penalties for it being you know. A from the endangered species or what, or the migratory yeah, bird? Yeah, if it were an ESE, right. If it was a protected under Migratory Bird Species uh, Treaty Act, um, yeah, that would be a violation in itself. Um, and the smuggling is a violation. Um, that pretty much so covers like, uh, smuggling. Can they, face real, can they face real jail time for this? I guess is Absolutely. Good. Yes. <laughs> um, we have uh, some of our investigations. We've had uh, the folks are uh, have been in jail. Uh, we've had, I think, one gentleman. He was uh, sentenced to two years in federal prison on a, an investigation um, about three years ago. Hmm. So, and we, you know, we we've. Uh, we work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the U.S. Attorney's Office as well for federal prosecution on these, especially if they're involved in trafficking and sales of, of these protected birds. Do you do you know how many you, you rescue like yearly? Um, I thought I had a slide on that, but um, we have one year. I think we had about 550 um, uh, MBTA species that were. Um, were uh, you know, caught and released. Wow. Um, this is a really interesting question somebody has. She, she asks what kind of, are, especially I think now that like the traps are actually illegal, are you doing outreach with local communities to get the word out about this rule? We, we do, we've had, um, you know, we've done stuff on uh, our uh, Twitter and, and our FWC Facebook. With the rule changes, we we've um, we hand out pamphlets that we've created to like uh, you know people in like uh, pet shops and uh, feed supply stores, um, mm -hmm. farmers and people uh, that are out there in the field and and like you folks that are out there birding. If you were to see something like this, to know what to do and sometimes what what to do is uh, not as uh, obvious. Uh, so if you like, take the trap away and then call us and then we get there and the guy leaves and there's really nothing to do. It'd be mm. better just to observe and report, you know, uh -huh. see what, say, hey, this is what I have. This is, a, this is how you get there. This is a, a very solid location. Um, and then let us come and do a surveillance and catch the guy and then save the birds. And then the big one is after we catch them, and we squeeze him a little bit, he likes to take us to his aviary at home where he has 50 or 100 more of them. Wow. Well, um, oh, here's, a, here's an interesting question. If, if, there, if you find a feather on the ground, a pretty feather, is it illegal to take that feather home? And is, if it is, is that enforced? Um, by the letter of the law, that would be protected, but uh, that wouldn't. That would be an officer discretion. I would hope that <laughs> would be uh, writing tickets for that. And th th this is an interesting question. Um, th this uh, person asks, "What about foreign tourists, like from Italy, illegally trapping birds for eating? Is that a is that a thing you've ever encountered?" Uh, what type of bird would be that my question? I mean, I, I, uh, yeah. I would say a, a painted bunting wouldn't offer a whole lot of nutrition. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. Um, somebody says uh, that their neighbor has birds in his garage and backyard, but 
they, they don't know what kind of birds they are. Is there something that they can do? I mean, I guess aside from like spying on their neighbor. <laughs> Uh, and that's a that's a good question because uh, and keeping in mind that in the pet trade, you know, there's hundreds of species of birds that are completely legal that are sold probably, I would guess, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of birds in the pet trade for, uh, for pets every year in Florida. So many of those um, love birds and, and, and such, those are all parakeets, those are not protected. Uh-huh. Um, oh, this was a good one that came up a while ago and I, and I forgot, I wanted to ask you this, um, it, because people post pictures like photographers and birders love to post pictures of the birds that they're seeing and they put locations sometimes, uh, does this increase the risk of the birds being trapped? Like, are, do you think there are people like watching these boards? I, I doubt it, you know, and that was one of my uh, concerns about, uh, you know, if somebody were to be watching this right now, that would be, you know, watching it for nefarious purposes and they're mm -hmm. learning uh, how, what we're doing to catch them. But I, I, I'm pretty confident that's not happening. Um, there's a couple, there's a couple questions about you. If, if you ever see people taking bird, collecting the eggs, stealing eggs. So, uh, most of these birds, I've never seen a, well, there's a couple things to talk about. Uh, firstly, uh, I should have mentioned it, you know, most of these species do not, are, are not able to be bred in captivity. So that's, uh, if they were, we'd have, you know, bunting uh, captive facilities that are breeding them. And they, and they, they so that's one of the risks of, of these types of birds is that, that it's, as far as I know, it's almost impossible to breed them in captivity. Huh. Um, what was the second part of your question? I lost with, my train they of were just wondering if people were collecting the eggs. Do you ever run into that? So I've never had um, a, one of these species of a nest with eggs. I know that they exist, um, but I've just never seen them. Yeah, listen. Um, so, I mean, other, just... other than the other than other than like, you know, cardinals and, and uh, blue jays and, and some of the other ones that are mm -hmm. uh, native mockingbirds that are native uh, year round. Um, oh, here's a new one. Um, somebody had an interesting comment that in, in the Yucatan, the largest market sold trapped birds. And I guess this person was there and they asked ornithologists if they could go and buy the birds. It was like five or $10 each. And the ornithologist told them that it would only encourage more trapping if they knew someone would buy them. Uh, and that evidently there was like a hierarchy of the trappers where those that were trapping the cardinals were protecting an area where the cardinal call had a very specific dialect. Um, it's just an interesting comment. Um, um, I, I would agree. I mean, if you're creating a market, you know, you might be thinking you're doing the right thing to help uh, protect the bird, but by creating a market, um, you know, they're going to go out there and catch more birds. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, and yeah, lots of people are asking about the eggs. Somebody said, um, Rich said that egg collection used to be a big thing in England. Um, just, and, and that might be uh, may, maybe one of the uh, members may know more about it for the, you know, outside of Florida, like in the, because many of these species, you know, they, they nest, uh, they breed not, this isn't a breeding area. So they, yeah. they go back home and they breed uh, in the Northern states. Yeah. How many, um, how many traps? So we talked about how many birds, do you know how many traps you find a year? We had one year, I think we had over a hundred traps in a year. We wow. had a whole, two sheds, uh, evidence sheds in our compound filled with traps. Jeez. Typically, you know, on uh, someone will have, you know, two, four, six uh, traps that they'll deploy, except for some of the uh, really big uh, players that they have, you know, uh, maybe they have 20, 30, 50 traps. Wow. <laughs> So somebody wonders, uh, Natasha wonders, what's the most surprising bird smuggling attempt you've encountered? Like, you know, there's birds being put in toilet paper tubes and things like that. Um, 
I, I guess like in the, you know, your groin area that they, you know, and I'm, I'm just trying to, when I've seen it, I'm trying to imagine sitting on an airplane or, you know, the pre-boarding stuff going on and, you know, all the delay and maybe you have to go to the restroom or I, I don't know. How do you sit down and some of these folks, they don't have like baggy pants. I'm just, I don't even know how the bird can survive. Well, it's crazy. It's crazy pants. And I, I wonder like how, how you get through security with that. Because like, if I have my license in my pocket, when I go through security, I get, I get uh, patted down. So how do they get through with these birds taped to their groins? It's just a, you know, a numbers game that you have, you know, millions of passengers coming through an airport uh, in a year. Um, and uh, you take, take a, from that, you know, Miami is such an international airport. So so many are, are foreign uh, flights and it, they just, you know, they don't want to delay commerce. So we got to, you know, and, and, you know, I understand that it, I've been on those long flights and you get to your destination. And the last thing you want is a, an hour or two delay to check through your stuff. So. Yeah. Right. What, Oh, somebody wants to know what country, is there a country that most of the um, smuggling comes from? Uh, for the birds, Cuba. Cuba. And are, are, do most are, do mo, are most the are most of the traps you find found on private property or like out in on public land? I'd say probably more on private property, and uh, so, you know it could be an urban area, uh, apartment complex, or it could be you know a guy that had like a farm with with 10, 20 acres, uh, it, but uh, you see it everywhere. Jeez. Um, so, oh, so somebody, Scott is wondering if you work in conjunction with, with the law enforcement officers like in Cuba to prevent the smuggling, is there any like talking there? There, we have had um, US Fish and Wildlife, um, they went over there and then trying to, you know, actually it's like just to get a, a firm answer of whether or not it's, it's legal or illegal, which it is illegal, but uh, because of the form of government and uh, the corruption, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, they don't really uh, cooperate with us. Mm. And it's, but so then once they get the birds where they're going, how, uh, where do they sell them? Where's what? Where's the market for these birds? Like in this country, where's the, the market? Ma the market is all over Florida, specifically South Florida. So they, uh, you know, there's a there's a market because someone wants to have one of these beautiful songbirds in their house to sing, and then they uh, they want to buy one for their wife and their daughter, and they uh, so th they create that market is created from the culture. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny because as you were saying that somebody said that they heard that it, it, there are parks in Miami where the trappers are selling the birds and they're wondering if you've ever had tips about that happening in the parks down in Miami. All the time. And, and uh, most of those folks like the AD Barnes Park is one of them. Uh, uh, most of the folks know uh, what's illegal and what's not. And they'll have a, a non-protected species that looks similar like the grass squids There's two species of grass squids and that one is protected, one is not. And they'll have the non-protected or they'll have the Cuban bullfinch mm. or other non-protected species. And can, and like, if you find a bunch of traps on, on land, can you ever seize that land or no? No. That was, um, this has been really interesting. I like I like feel like I'm in an episode of like a procedural drama, cop drama. Um, oh, here's somebody wants somebody wants to know if you've ever rated a songbird singing competition. We have. That's amazing. We have we we had a tip on a location. Uh, this is many years ago, um, and we did a surveillance and we're. Um, we're watching and you know we see all these uh, traps and cages and they're displaying and early in the morning on a Sunday morning and then uh, I send my partner in that looks a little blends in better than I do 
and uh, he comes in and, and then he comes back to the truck. He goes, oh, yeah, they got painted. They got indigo. They've got some other birds. I don't know what they are, uh, you know, and, and then that initiated, initiated a, a big investigation that ended up with 90 federal felonies from that little tip. Wow. Wow. Um, and when you go in, are you armed? Uh, yeah. What you talk in a, in an undercover capacity? Um, I it well, it was, on the, I think it's sort of a general question. Uh, yeah, we're law enforcement, so we we're armed. You're always armed. Um, somebody wants this is a, this is a good question for everybody to hear the answer to. Somebody asked if they should uh, destroy a trap if they find one. The best thing to do would be to just to call um, FWC and our dispatch, and we'll uh, send somebody out there. Just don't disturb it. Try to get us the, the biggest thing that you could do to help us is to make sure because if it's in a remote location, try to get a very specific uh, directions for so our officers to get there. Um, so we can find it and we can uh, we can do a surveillance on it and maybe make a case. Cool. Yeah. Um, and I think that's we've got one more question for you, and I think we're going to wrap up. Um, our last question is. Um, are, uh, oh, well, I'm gonna have two. I'm gonna ask you, are many of the officers as knowledgeable as you are about the birds? I, I'll i be honest, and um, until about 12 years ago, I wasn't very knowledgeable. I, I don't consider myself that knowledgeable compared to you folks that know so much about birds. Um, you know, I'm a cop, so I know a lot about law enforcement. And of course, Florida Fish and Wildlife has a lot of responsibilities that a lot uh, that vary uh, from, you know, marine patrol for boating accidents, fatality investigations, uh, boating safety, hunting. Uh, so we're all over the place. So, uh, but you know, it, we our folks try to find a niche that they, uh, and that, this is something that I fell into. You know, I, I like birds, and we have a lot of other folks on my team that, that love birds as well. And we, we've learned from some of our ornithologists uh, how to handle the birds, how to identify the birds, and uh, sending uh, pictures if we're not sure to, to verify. Some of the sparrows are, are unbelievably difficult mm -hmm. to identify, you know, and it's mm -hmm. like, well, I'm pretty sure it's a sparrow, but there's, you know, 50 different species that could be. <laughs> and, uh, and so that we, yeah. Uh, uh, we we do have it varies the question uh, to answer the question it varies uh, some of our folks know uh, very almost nothing about birds they they would say well that's a pelican and that's a cormorant <laughs> and that's about all I know about birds <laughs> well we I think everyone here is grateful to you and uh, the people that you work with for everything that you do and I want to know if you can give us the uh, FWC phone number so I can put it in the chat um, so that everybody can write it down if they want it. Um, and it varies. There's like a once we use a private number, so I would have to search that up. Um, but there's a, a 1 800 um, number that gets you to the, it'll take you to dispatch that's in your region. And then from there, like we have a dispatch center up in West Palm Beach. Uh, Lake Worth right off the turnpike if you when you're on the turnpike at the Lake Worth um, service plaza mm -hmm. there's a big building there and that's our dispatch center for this area um, cool. but I don't have that right now uh, I can uh, if you give me a few minutes I, I can stay on and uh, put it in the chat sure that'd be awesome okay um, thank you so much um, this has been this has been awesome um, let me, th I'm going to throw it back over to, um, to Scott now to, to close up for the night. Um, but I had a good time hearing about this. So Scott, take it. <laughs> wow, that was a, a great presentation. Thank you so much, Captain Marvin. Um, I learned so much and I, I could, I mean, I like watching um, police type dramas. So I could probably have another 20 questions about specifics, but I, I refrained myself from asking. Um, and I was the one who was curious about the, uh, the, the question about rating the, um, 
rating the songbird competition. I just could visualize that happening with birds singing and people scrambling and like and, uh, it's a movie. What a what yeah, a great a right. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. In fact, somebody, somebody, if, if there's a screenplay writer out there, there's a movie here. I guarantee I'm, I'm you. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> so that was great. That was so good. Uh, so uh, you 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 mentioned that um, you've been doing this a while. I know you've been doing it for 27 years, Captain uh, Marvin. Uh, so we, are you planning on retiring the next few years and passing passing the the, the mantle on to someone else? Yeah, we, uh, I've been, you know, we've been mentoring uh, people for years and not just for, you know, migratory birds for everything, you know, and that's a, a big part of my role now is, is passing along my, you know, my knowledge and um, it happened so quickly, you know, it seemed like just the other day I was a young investigator doing this and now I'm the boss and, uh, and uh, there's a big gap. Sometimes people leave our agency for other law enforcement jobs. So yes, that's, uh, but uh, to answer the question, uh, there's been a recent change in the legislation uh, to try to keep some old timers around in law enforcement. So I may be sticking around for up to six more years. Okay, well, I, I, the birds, the birds are, are applauding right now. <laughs> they're glad, they're glad you might be staying longer. And if you ever want to join us on one of our field trips, we would love to have you, by the way, and, uh, you know, share our knowledge about birds and, and learn and learn and learn from you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, and if you, thank oh, you and, Scott I, and Natasha um, put in the, the number for us. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Thanks, Natasha. Natasha. So much appreciated. Well, uh, we've come to the end of another incredible evening. Uh, we've had uh, a great presentation on uh, Purple Martins. Uh, you've learned about what we're doing and a little bit about them. Uh, you've learned about the incredible California condor, that giant mythical bird, that iconic bird. And then you've learned about something that I think a lot of us have been curious about but haven't known much about. And, and that's the illegal trapping of songbirds. And this is just such a great evening. I, I so appreciate our presenters tonight and everybody for being here. And I just wanna let you know, uh, next month again, we have uh, Dr. Reed Bowman from Archibald um, Research Station, uh, and he'll be presenting on protecting the, end the endangered red cockaded woodpecker, which I know is also gonna be a great presentation and something we'll all be excited to see. So until then, another evening has come to an end. I, I bid everybody good night. I hope you have, I hope you get out there and do some birding, what's left of the birds. I mean, it's all pretty much uh, the endemic birds now. Most of the um, migrants have left, uh, practically all of them have left, but what's wonderful out there still is all the breeding birds that are, that are in full breeding behavior. And there are so many chicks and ducklings and all of those around. It's really exciting to see still. And then we have the June challenge coming up and we'll send you more information about that via an email. Uh, hopefully you'll participate in that and, and extend your birding season all the way through June. And so anyway, we'll see you again on June 7th. Until then, uh, thank you presenters. Thank you, Autumn Quixote. Thank you, um, Rich, Richard, uh, Rich for being our, our administrator behind the scene, Rich Raphael that is, for being our administrator behind the scene. Uh, uh, of course, Shelly and Clive for their wonderful presentations as well this evening. And uh, good night, everyone. Have a have a have a great rest of the evening, and go get some dinner. Bye, everybody. Thank you.